Hello, and thank you for joining us today. My name is Meg Mason. I'm the Marketing Director here at HydroPoint Data Systems, and welcome to our fourth in the series, the educational series, focusing on outsmarting the drought. Um, we're aiming for this webinar to be about 20 to 25 minutes with a short question and answer section at the end. Should you need to jump off at any time, don't worry. We're recording the entire webinar, and we'll be posting it on our website afterwards. If you have any trouble at all, feel free to type in your questions into the chat section on the right-hand side, and we will respond to them. And if you have any questions for the moderator or the guest speaker, feel free to type those in the Q&A section on the right-hand side as well. Our moderator today is Chris Spain, CEO and co-founder of HydroPoint. Um, and now I'll turn it over to Chris for him to do a quick overview and an introduction for our guest speaker today. Thanks for the introduction, Meg, and thanks to everybody online who's taking a few moments of their day to join us. It's uh, exciting to see the audience build as we do each of these uh, webinars each week. Uh, the purpose of this series is straightforward. It's to provide a forum for a frank discussion about water conservation strategies as we face the current drought. And to be very clear, this isn't going to be an advertising platform for any vendor, including HydroPoint. It's rather a candid review of what has worked, and equally important, what has failed, so that people can get a real-world understanding of uh, what people's experience has been towards water conservation so that we all can benefit from our learning lessons. I think one of the big themes when we look at the uh, governor's new edict uh, in regards to water conservation is it's put a lot of urgency towards uh, the issue that's been lacking for a long time. So I know when uh, the Chronicle has a headline that says, Governor recommends a $10,000 fine for water wasters, that gets everybody's attention. I think uh, without a doubt, you know, when you look at the reservoirs and the situation as far as water supplies, uh, we've entered a new era that nobody can uh, any longer ignore. It's, it's an era where we really just can no longer afford to uh, ignore our water situation. I think that what's interesting about water in general is we've ignored it for so long that the level of waste is so systemic across so many different aspects of life that there's a huge opportunity to conserve without actually causing us too much pain. Um, I think really what I'd love to see is the discussion from the governor be about eliminating waste rather than uh, reducing use. Uh, of course, they're hand in hand, but I think psychologically uh, it's no longer possible for us to be wasting water. And if we reduce waste by 90, 95%, that's a lot more meaningful to me than just reducing use by 35%, regardless if you've been conserving or not. But uh, hopefully these discussions and others will, will get people more oriented towards a more productive perspective. So towards that goal, uh, let me introduce Rachel, uh, who's somebody who's actually been in the forefront of actually saving water in a substantial way. Uh, Rachel's background is uh, just perfect for this webinar. She's a master of science. She's an accredited professional with lead. Uh, she's an environmental stewardship manager, and she works for one of the biggest property owners in the United States, and definitely in Northern Southern California, Kaiser Permanente. So, uh, Let's welcome Rachel to the webinar, and thank you, Rachel, for joining us today. Thanks for having me. Great. So why don't we start off with the basic and uh, describe for us what uh, your role is at Kaiser and uh, what, what your focus has been lately. Well, as my title <laughs> aptly states, I suppose, um, I'm responsible for all elements of environmental stewardship for Kaiser's Northern California region that starts as far south as Fresno. Bakersfield is assigned to our Southern California region, and then as far north as Santa Rosa, and then we, you know, go into the South Bay, so a little bit west, if you will. Um, so I work with all of our non-clinical operational leaders, so on everything from water conservation, energy conservation, renewable energy, waste reduction, procurement of environmentally responsible products, um, healthy and sustainable food, and so on. Um, and I work to advance and support those efforts uh, across Kaiser. That's a broad mandate. I mean, it's definitely multidimensional, I imagine, because you're looking at so many different silos, and with such a large organization like Kaiser, it must uh, comprehend a lot of different components of environmental stewardship. It does. It keeps me on my toes. I am a self-describe. I describe myself as a generalist, and it works perfectly for this job because I need to be able to bounce between 
you know, 15 topics in a given day at 21 different medical centers or 500 sites and be effective in all of those areas. So it's a little wild, but fun. Yeah, we work with a lot of sustainability uh, managers and executives, and I think it's been interesting to hear how it sort of goes through these arcs of excitement and general enthusiasm and then sort of a bracing cold shower when people realize that it's actually going to take effort and change of behavior and change of process. I mean, how do you keep everybody's enthusiasm up from the initial phase to the execution phase? Uh, I try not to make it sort of a each new project or each thing being a new and short-term thing. We try to develop them as long-term integrated um, elements of their daily work in order to make this a normal way of doing business and not really, um, I try not to use the phrase the right thing to do because uh, we just, I just try to make this a critical element of everybody's work. And then a big part of what I do is I just try to help people overcome their boundaries and maybe it's hand holding, maybe it's doing it for them. Um, if it's going to get them past that initial step, we all you know, get stuck in areas in our personal and professional lives, and we can all use a little help. And so that's what I try to provide. That makes sense. And do you have to, how helpful is feedback systems that help people understand how their progress is doing or how the company as a whole is progressing towards its goals? Um, well, uh, very helpful if I can just show people how they're performing against their peers. We're, we're competitive species, and so we do well um, with, with good data, um, how to present that data is always uh, interesting. You want to, you know, I try to think about like norming and positive feedback and things like that to um, to utilize information. And also we lean on our, poli I'm lucky enough to have a work for a company that has policies that mandate particular performance and environmental stewardship. And so I have the benefit of leaning on those policies as the foundation of the work. Oh, that's excellent. So how long has water been a part of your efficiency, uh, your Kaiser's programs, and how does water play a role in what you guys do? I mean, is it a large component, or, you know, and if so, why? Well, for many years we've had um, low flow fixtures, drought tolerant landscaping, and more efficient um, systems as our base of design for new construction or, you know, new builds or build outs, if you will. Um, however, we'll, in, um, so that's been in place for at least five years. Then um, when it comes to really tackling water as a national priority for our company, we began the process of developing a national water um, conservation policy in 2012 that policies in Kaiser take a very long time in large part because we vet it through so many vet them through through so many stakeholders, which is a good thing. So um, we really um, started thinking about the process in 2012, 2013. We went through the process of developing it. 2014, it was ratified, and then we've been working towards specific and measurable results um, since uh, the beginning of 2014. And so that's how long it's formally been in place with more structural directives um, in place for quite a bit longer. That's great. So you're, you're the governor's dream company, and you guys are ahead well, of the Well, at the same time, we, we in many places, you'll know, or you may have seen or heard that we put in drought-tolerant landscaping, and then some, some, you know, somebody within that facility really likes themselves some turf, and so that landscape gets pulled out, and we get turf, and then now we're... Um, redoubling uh, to pull that turf back out. So it's not the, that doesn't happen everywhere, but it definitely has happened. So I don't know if we're the dream. But well, it's funny. I mean, I was just thinking about it. Um, the uh, idea of, you know, a nice landscape is really key. And just, I, I can't imagine going to a hospital for a procedure and looking out the window and seeing a ugly landscape. It just seems antithetical to the healing process, as silly as it might seem. But um, you know, a nice lush grass or a nice, you know, vibrant landscape is definitely something you'd want to see versus go to a place where it's, you know, scrub brush and uh, tumbleweeds. Right, right. So, so we what, always think about 
about member perception, but also have to think about, you know, like at our Fresno facility, we're donating water to um, people who have no access to clean and plentiful water um, right now. So we really should not be using water for um, anything but critical purposes. Yeah, it's an interesting balance you guys have to play. What What are the water projects in, that you guys are doing? How does water affect the different aspects of your business? I mean, what are, what are sort of the usages that you guys are using at Kaiser as far as water use in general and specifically? Well, there are two... Um, two of the most critical areas, one is hand hygiene um, to prevent spread of infection. So hand washing is of utmost importance to every clinician that literally touches patients. Um, and alcohol rubbing isn't, you know, isn't as good as hand washing. So hand hygiene is critical, which uses water. Um, and then also sterilization of um, equipment used in patient and surgical um, procedures that uses um, water for steam. Um, it's a steam sterilization process. So, uh, and then finally, the building um, mechanical uh, systems, the cooling towers and central utility plant needs water in order to operate and keep the building running and keep it um, a tolerable temperature and humidity at the appropriate level to, again, prevent spread of infection and patient com enhance patient comfort. So, so those I mean, are the critical functions. It's so interesting. I mean, in so many ways, I mean, obviously water is key for every building, but for your business, I mean, it's mission critical just in regards to its ability to deliver on the main mandate, which is help people get healthier. Right. Uh, if you guys didn't have your water, then I guess, you know, from hand washing to sterilization to proper temperature, uh, you guys would be in a lot of... Uh, hurt you didn't have the water supply you need. So I can see why you guys are, you know, forward thinking as far as conservation goes. So towards that goal, I mean, what's the key component to smart water management is if there is one? I mean, does there, you know, how, how do you look at smart water management as far as its first initial or most primary ingredient to make yourself successful? I think being flexible uh, and creative uh, and recognizing and just talking to people about their feelings and beliefs about water um, and when and where it is truly needed at our sites. Uh, we have so many different sites with so many different technology, pre-existing technologies and uses um, that I think mostly flexibility. I, ideally, we would have better data, but um, water metering and water billing and water pricing are all still stuck in the last century. And we, um, so while that would be very helpful as a foundation to um, really drive improved performance, we're still catching up. We are utilizing the lead water credit as a foundation of what we should be doing, including that sub-metering for water. But um, so data would be one, flexibility another, uh, and just testing out technology. Yeah, I, I could totally see that. And we're definitely hearing that across other industries. I mean, it's interesting how uh, loaded the topic of water is. We did a, a residential program a couple of years ago with one of the larger water agencies down south, and we did a focus group. And they're the nicest group of people until we brought up water rates and water agencies, and they turned into a very vigorously argumentative group of people. Uh, so this water turns out to be a very sensitive touch topic and touchstone for a whole host of different issues for people, depending on what their orientation is. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we see it all the time, exactly what you're saying, which is the technology still is just starting to catch up to what the visibility requirement is as far as providing you the right data at the right time so that you can make intelligent decisions. Uh, right. I mean, it's basically, it's kind of hilarious when we're going for water rebates um, that we have to fax um, or <laughs> mail things to them and triplicate. Um, and it's really just a representation of the inefficiency of the situation. Yeah, that's a great example. It's, uh, we're betwixt and between the technology worlds of what we've been sort of, everybody's been making a big valley view about this whole digital domain, and it turns out we're still faxing. I love that example. Mm -hmm. um, for you guys, what, what's changed, if anything, since the governor's executive order? Is, is this something that's empowering you to for 
as far as getting people on board, or is it something that's just adding a lot more noise to this conversation? Um, you know, how how do you guys look at it from both an internal and external perspective? It's done a lot of good. I mean, in general, I think it's good. Um, so our senior leadership, the CEO of Kaiser, um, ha is very interested. Our board of directors is now very interested in asking what we're doing and what problems they can help solve. Um, so that's really helpful. That breaks down a lot of barriers. But if if they can, in fact, help solve for clinicians flushing um, wipes down our toilets that clog all of our drains and make it so that low flow toilets are not effective. Um, we, you know, the proof will be in the pudding if that we can truly change that behavior um, effectively. So I am not sure. I'm really hopeful. Um, it has enabled us to, it, it with the CEO and board of directors' interest, it then that has trickled down to the. Um, we also have chief operating officers at all of our medical centers. Our medical centers are a hospital, and then all of the med supporting clinical spaces where you might have your standard doctor's visit, podiatry visit, something like that. Um, those um, chief operating officers are also really changing their perspective on their love of grass and sort of a lush entry and landscape of the facility to being willing and more open for more drought tolerant um, landscaping. While we were just tackling the irrigation systems, um, we now are more capable of also tackling the plants themselves. But with that brings with it the challenge of integrating the plant solution with the irrigation solution and making sure those uh, get installed and implemented hand in hand. So that so both a benefit and a challenge there, but we're working through that. Um, and and just a lot of questions, but questions are good. It means people are paying attention and I just hope what I really think is is what's going to make a difference is people personally changing their practices. Whereas with energy in a hospital or medical office building, yeah, you might ask people to turn off their lights, but truly we could just do motion sensors and we can override any human element in the in that system. It's harder with water. You really need humans to operate themselves differently. And um and that gets harder because people are stubborn and stuck in their ways. So yeah, that's a really great point. I think it's so interesting. I just love how um, the devil's in the details. I mean, it seems like low flow toilets is a no-brainer for a medical uh, installation, and yet, to your point, you guys have specific cleanliness and sterilization issues that are contrary to the way the low flow toilet functions. So, and you have a, a specific requirement for it to be able to work, and um, you know, for every complicated problem, there's a simple solution. It's usually the wrong one. I think it's a great example of how, you know, a specific workplace has specific needs that don't neatly fold into what is usually the solution in all cases. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we our plumbing is just in some of our older sites is just in horrible shape, and we don't have enough water moving through that system. Then we get backups and all sorts of problems. Um, the soap that's used in order to have you know the hand height people are washing them, their hands all day long, so there's a lotion in our soap um, in order to help keep hands hydrated, and um, that causes this scum buildup and then if you add that, you know, if you have hard water and then this soap, then there's all of this other buildup of, of yuck that we have to figure out how to clean out and, you know, so so then the question is, do we invest in new plumbing? Well, that's a lot of money and is that where we should be putting our money versus maybe, you know, operating more hours to serve more members and have them get access to their um, doctors at, at more amenable hours to their working needs, you know. So it's, it's a lot of financial balancing. Um, but with the nice thing about the regulatory um, requirement is that we have to comply with regulations. So that makes it a more um, compelling argument. Same with the uh, announcement that came out today about, uh, renew about greenhouse gas emissions for California. So we have to comply with these things. And and so it's always helpful for regulation to be there. Yeah, I think I think it's uh, that's a great example with the, the hand lotion. I mean, I think everybody just thinks why isn't 
why would, doesn't everybody just implement these implementations immediately? And it, the complexity is it has to work within the constraints and environment of the business itself, which is usually unique, uh, and it's, you know, specific deliverables that you know can't be broadly applied to all situations. Um, so it, this isn't really a question we talked about previously, uh, but what in your mind, if you're talking to somebody who has your job in a different field, but the same sort of deliverable, what kind of advice would you give them as far as you know how to approach problems and projects and goal setting? And I mean, if, if you could travel back in time, what would you tell yourself when you started the job that uh, you wish you'd known when you started? Well, I would say, if possible, start outside of the building with landscaping and irrigation. It's definitely the easiest by far. Um, I mean, I, I would be specifically talking to someone in healthcare. I would say do a, more product testing and um, for fixtures and toilets and downstream like verification that the systems can handle lower flow and solve for plumbing problems possibly first or maybe simultaneously. Um, I almost like that some of these Lower flow fixtures are causing a little bit of problem, which is forcing bigger solutions. But we don't want that at the expense of having um, a toilet overflowing in a patient's room. I mean, that's horrible, which we have. And so I'm like, okay, do we, we want to save a bit of water and flush in the toilet? But the downfall is that then we're wasting a ton of water in a in a flood, and we're putting patients into a bad situation when they're already probably very uncomfortable because they're in the hospital. Which right, and one accessible too. Right. Yeah, I think, and I, I guess what you're saying too is, you know, it's good to get a good win up first, establish a beachhead of success, which gives you more, you know, ability to get people on your side and cooperating and funding and budgeting and approving additional projects as you go on. I think definitely we've seen a lot of people bite off more they can chew on the sustainability side and and it just gets burdened with a whole host of uh, issues that make it difficult to get subsequent success. Yeah, and I think my like a more sort of tangible recommendation is to not go with motion sensor toilets because they just keep flushing, and I don't think that there's a real benefit to them. Yeah, real flow is fine, but motion sensors, they just keep flushing. So yeah, it's, it's a small thing, but I think important. <laughs> yeah, it's so funny. I mean, it's interesting how... You think the technology is going to be straightforward, and then when you do the actual implementation, there's a far cry between what's on this whiteboard and what actually is implemented. Yeah. I'm always, I'm always amazed how field trials reveal so many gaps and flaws. Right. Well, thanks. This has been great, Rachel. Um, I think we have a couple questions. Meg, do you have a couple questions to put forth to Rachel from the audience? Yeah, so perfect. So one question came in, um, and it sounds like you you know how, do use water both indoor and outdoor. Um, and you're working on the water efficiencies for both. What would you say um, is the you know difference between how much water you're using outdoor as opposed to indoor? I have no clue. I could. I mean, I think it's all. All I know is based on what others um, estimate for water use um, on our similar types of campuses, because there's absolutely no sub metering uh, of those systems until now. We have smart. We have the hydroplane smart controllers, so we will have a better understanding uh, within a, you know, once it's been a year since we've installed, and then we can do that evaluation. But I have no clue. Yeah, that. And it all depends. You know, we just we've had underline, we've had mainline breaks. You know, which one of our best performing service areas, their usage shot up 40 percent with just a break for that yeah. year. And, I think that's what's so interesting about the whole water conundrum is, is your success you have to build each day. <laughs> you know, yeah. you can, you're saving water today. Great, great job. Okay, next day, new deliverable. You've got to save water again today. And mm -hmm. uh, it's easy to lose all your gains in just one break. So it, it, all comes it really out. is. It's so different from energy where you mostly don't have something that breaks and then just sucks a ton of energy. That's not... <laughs> Exactly. The building, you know, the building is relatively predictable for summer and winter, um, um, and it, it, 
but with water, I'm like, wow, in Modesto, you're doing amazing, amazing, amazing. Suddenly, mainline break they didn't know about for a period of time, and then they're not doing amazing, and you can't get mad at them about that. And it messes up their data, and then then the data I'm utilizing is just not accurate. And then I also have a bunch of service area of my service areas that are using well water or ground direct groundwater, what have you, which is unmetered, and therefore I their performance from their bills might look good. They might I might think they're our best performers, but they in fact might not be because some large percent of their water is is unmetered and not paid for. Exactly. So I don't, I try not even, I almost don't put much stock in the data that I utilize or I give, you know, big, you know, uh, disclaimers before I address it. That's great. I totally agree. We see it all the time with our customers too. Okay. Well, I think we've used up the time for today. Rachel, you were fantastic. Uh, Thanks for your insights into what is obviously a a very busy job keeping track of all these different sites, and uh, it's so interesting to hear how much you know Kaiser depends on water for so many different components of just delivering healthcare, let alone just the business and uh, operations perspective. Uh, so I, I wish you the best of luck, and uh, thanks for taking your time today to share your thoughts and uh, observations. My pleasure. Thanks. Take thanks care, Rachel. Me. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye bye. Bye. Thank you, everybody, for joining us today. We will be recording the session, and it will be posted online at the URL listed, hydropoint.com slash drought dash webinar. Um, hope you have a great day, and we'll see you next Thursday, same time, same place. Thank you. Bye.